We've been preaching, we've been studying through the kind of the Nicene Creed. And, and in the mornings, let me just give a little explanation. In the mornings, we read the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed is kind of like the earliest statement of faith, right? Before we had the Bible to kind of say, here's the things that we believe in. Because they lived in a time when people weren't sure, like, well, do we believe this about this? And maybe Jesus was just this, and this is how we believe. And said, you know what? Let's sit down and let's kind of let's talk about what we believe based on the scriptures that are at hand, based on our experiences, and based on where the Holy Spirit leads us. And so they put together this first creed that we kind of, we see now as the Apostles' Creed, and, and, and that worked for a little while, but then we got more nuanced and we had more issues. Because believe it or not, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but people complicate things, <laughs> right? That's what we do, isn't it? We complicate things. I, I think of, you know, I, I try going back to study U.S. history stuff, and I remember when we started in our Bill of Rights, how many, how many did we have in the Bill of Rights? There were like 10, right? We're like, we got that. And now how many laws are there? They're like a gabajillion, right? Like that's a real number, a gabajillion, right? That, that's a technical number. Like there's a lot. And why? Because life gets complex and we complicate it. And so in the same way, we started asking deeper questions and bringing forth kind of bigger issues. And, and, and probably the biggest part of this issue was, okay, who is this person, Jesus? And that's why so much of this is dedicated to be, we believe that Jesus is this, and Jesus is this, and this is what we believe about Jesus. And I'm hoping that this, this, through these teachings, we've better understood what we as Christians believe about Jesus. And when I say we as Christians, I'm not talking about just the Nazarene church, right? We, we, we proclaim that we're a part of something bigger, this holy apostolic, this holy Catholic church. Oh, pastor said the C word. It's okay for those who don't know, right? Catholic is not a denomination. I know we think of it as the Roman Catholic church, but the Catholic church just means the church universal. Catholic just means the big church. We're a part of the Catholic church. Oh, did pastor just say, it's okay. Again, relax, breathe, breathe, right? It's all good. But these are the things that hold us together because the Baptists are a part of the Catholic Church, a statement you don't hear very often, right? What? Totally, totally. The Methodists are part of the Catholic Church or the Church Catholic. Maybe that's a better way to put this, right? Chris is giving me the nod. Yeah, right? The Church Catholic. The, the Pentecostals and the Charismatics and their craziness, they're a part of the Church Catholic. And what holds them together is these beliefs that saying, well, we, we see some of the stuff differently. In the essentials, there's unity. In non-essentials, charity. And in all things, love, right? And so the, these are the unity. These are the things that say we all believe this. So if you leave here and you go again to Pastor Keith's church in New Canaan, he's going to tell you the same thing about these essential things. This is what we believe about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit very often for us becomes the forgotten God. In fact, I think Francis Chan actually wrote a book called Holy Spirit, the Forgotten God which is a really great book um, because it's what happens. The Holy Spirit kind of becomes like we believe in the Father. We're all about Jesus, right? We're Jesus freaks. And then the Holy Spirit kind of becomes, I think, like the, the power they have or something. But when we speak of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit isn't this, this, this thing of God. The Holy Spirit is God. And so one of the things that we say of the Holy Spirit in our proclamation, in our confession, is that we believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life. So we do believe that there is a Holy Spirit. And we believe that this Holy Spirit is the Lord. It's not of the Lord. It's not like the Lord. It is the Lord. And it is the giver of life. Amen. Amen. It is the giver of life. That was a honk of, of assurance. That's where I'm going, right? Uh, affirmation. <laughs> See, I get affirmative. Look, if we don't cry out amen, the horns will. Amen? Come on. I'm just saying. Okay, so it's the spirit of affirmation. The spirit of affirmation. No, the spirit gives life. And this is the part that I want us to really kind of be focusing on today, this part that, that's so important for us to understand. And so because I, you know, I went back and I listened to Pastor Josh's sermon last week. So when you all preach, I'm not here, I listen. I go back and check to make sure, right? Because I don't know if you're talking bad about me when I'm gone. Okay, and, and Josh, Josh dropped a couple of terms there. As soon as he said, I was like, that's awesome. That's my man right there. But um, because of that, it, it caught me, you know, I was praying about this. Like, you know what? We're going to go there. So if you go to Genesis 1, beginning in verse 1 through 3, and, and a lot of you know, okay, you're like, oh, you're already rolling. The kids are already rolling their eyes. Going, Here we go, right? To me, these are really important verses. They're so important. You have to understand these before you can really understand anything else. But it says, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, 
The earth was formless and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. While a wind from God swept over the face of the waters, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, we've talked about this before, right? And we know that uh, in, in the beginning, what's happening here is that God is talking about the chaos and the emptiness and the darkness. There, the, the, what's the chaos and the emptiness? The what? The tohu and the bohu. See, y'all know some Hebrew now, right? The tohu and the bohu, the chaos and the emptiness. And these are so important because the reason they're here, the reason it starts off in the scripture is God wants you to know in this amazing book of hope that chaos and emptiness are real. He gets it. It's not a figment of your imagination. This is real. And he recognizes your situation. We all know about this chaos and this emptiness. But then it says that amidst this chaos and this emptiness, which brought on the darkness, the Spirit of God hovers over the water. So the Spirit of God hovers over the waters, and this presence of God, this presence of God was this catalyst that brought this tohu and the bohu, right? The chaos and the emptiness, it brought them into order and purpose. And this is so important because this is the same story that we hear throughout the Bible over and over and over again, right? There's chaos, there's emptiness, and because of that, there's darkness, and then we get the presence of God, and he turns that around to order and purpose, and then there's light, and then we're like, everything's good, yay, we love you, God, and then we go do our things, we're like, you know, not right now, God, not right now, and we leave God alone, and then it goes back to chaos and emptiness and darkness, we're like, wait, God, we need you, and God comes back, and he brings order and purpose, like, hey, God, it's good for you, okay, God, stay over there, I'm good with you, and my goodness, it's this vicious cycle that we've lived in throughout all of history, right? And this might even be just our typical Monday, right? Just like 14 times on Monday this happened to me. Am I the only one? No, okay, I'm just making sure. I thought I, maybe I am crazy. <laughs> I, they said I wasn't, but it might be. I don't know, my kids say. All right, so this presence of God does this. This, this is the work that God does in us. He brings order and purpose and light from our chaos, our emptiness, and our darkness. He gives us new life. This is good. And this is what he's been doing from the very beginning. You jump to the next chapter in Genesis 2, 7. It says, then the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground. Little, little fun fact. He formed Adam from Adam. What? You can look into that. That's, Adam means, means dirt. So he formed dirt from dirt. Okay, so he formed man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now, how many of you in here are human? If you don't know the answer, raise your hand. You are human, right? Okay. This is you. If you are human, this is you. You were created by God and the breath of God, the wind of God, the Holy Spirit of God was breathed into you personally for one reason, to give you life. This is true of every single person who is a human being. And here is where I think we really struggle. Because we very often confuse, or maybe we just settle with, not dying for life. Not dying is not the same as living. Having a heartbeat is not the same as having life. And so because of this, for many of us, we just walk around like zombies who, who function in many ways. We function, we get through, I make it through the days. Wake up, hit the clock, get up. How, I mean, let's, let's be honest. How many of you can do your morning routine without thinking about it and you drive? And if you're like me, you do this. Goes off, I get up. I go out. This is what I got this morning. Got up, walked to the kitchen, turned on the light because if I don't feed the dogs first thing in the morning, the world ends apparently. So I went to go feed the dogs. I looked at the stove on the clock and I realized the stove on the clock is not right. I'm up an hour early. I want to go back to bed, but these dogs, they don't understand. They know routine. And if I don't feed these dogs, the world is going to end. It's going to be horrible. They've told me so. So I fed the dogs. But I feed the dogs every morning. Then when I get done feeding the dogs, I walk over and I make the coffee. Because if there's no coffee, there's no life. I'm just saying. <laughs> I make the coffee. I go to my room, brush my teeth, 
get dressed. I come out, come to the church, do the prayer, work on my stuff. 7.30, I go back to the house. I drive Hannah and Kyle. I drive, turn right on Mercy Springs, turn left on San Luis, turn left into the junior high, drive around, past the line of people. Yes, I'm that guy. Just park in front because nobody knows how to drive through anyway. Hannah knows how to do the tuck and roll. You've got about three seconds, slow down, stop, love you, drive out. Almost ran over her phone the other day. Kyle will attest that. Hannah dropped her phone and you kept going and almost ran it over. I was like, the three second time was done. I'm moving. I rolled on. I come around. I go turn left on San Luis. I get to the four-way stop. Turn left because it's early enough that I don't have to fight the traffic yet. I turn left, go to the four-way stop, go through, turn right, turn right, come into the parking lot, pass one, two, three, fourth left, make it over there, turn left again. I'm at the bus exit. I get Kyle out at the gate. Okay, son, love you. I give Kyle more time because he's at that age in his life. You know, y'all remember like the post-puberty age where um, your feet are so big you still don't know how to walk. So sometimes Kyle takes forever to get in out, and I don't want to run him over. I like the boy, and he's pretty handy. So I let Kyle get out, drive home. Turn, I turn right now on... on on um, Ward Street, and then I go up to Overton. Woo, that's cool, right? Yeah, I'm that guy. New neighborhood, turn left, go. So guess what happens on a Saturday when I start driving down Mercy Springs at 8 in the morning if I'm not thinking? If I'm going to Walmart, I'm going to Walmart, which is that way. It doesn't matter. I'm back out of my driveway, and I'm going to go to Santa Barbara. And I'm going to turn right, and then I'm going to turn left on Place Road. I'm going to turn left on Ward, and I'm going to pull into the junior high, and I'm going to realize I'm the only person here. And that lady's staring at me like I'm a creep. Not just creep, just lost. And then I'm like, what was I doing this morning? Where am I going? You, am I the only one who does this? Right, because our lives are routine. Many of us, we function, but we don't have true life. And, and this was something that was so much more true for me even, even before all of this. I was, before, before I met Trina, before I, I had my kids, I was a functioning addict. Would you say that on the, on the outside, everything, I seem to have everything together. I have people telling me, like, I tell my family, like, I really think I have a drug a problem. You don't have a drug problem. Why? Like, that person has a drug problem. That person's just a ate up tweaker. Uh, like, they never got their job together. You have a job. You're self-supporting. You take care of your business. Like, you're not, you don't have a problem. I was a functioning addict. On the outside, I seemed to have everything together, but on the inside, I was dead. I was dying. And so much so that I, I looked forward to my outside catching up with my inside. I'm like, I'm dying on the inside, and I'm ready for my outside to catch up and just die on the outside too. I'm tired of this, this death walk that I'm doing. And, and after uh, Trina and I began seeking God in our lives, I, I started to grow, and, and, and there's a whole lot of other to that, but I came across this psalm. And, and this psalm for me... Um, became my psalm immediately. It was, a, I want to say, one of the first scriptures that I read in the Bible that just resonated with me. And I'm like, this guy wrote my song. You ever had that? Like, like, like I'm going to give you a quick story again because that's, I tell stories and waste time. My, my mom and, and, and she has a twin brother, Gilbert. They were born in 1940. Um, so they're, they're 40 models. Sorry, mom, I'm giving away your age. But this is important because that means that in 1957, they were 17 years old. And in 1957, there was this amazing, um, amazing singer from um, California, a uh, Mexican kid, little Chicano kid, named um, Ricardo Valenzuela, right? It's Ricky Valens. And he came out with the song, Donna. Oh, Donna, oh, Donna. Y'all know the song? Come on, sing it, right? So this is the cool thing. I, I loved Richie Valens before La Bamba came out. Like, I totally am a dweeb. Like, I loved him. And then the movie came out. I was like, I was the only one in junior high going, oh, my goodness, they're writing a movie about Richie Valens. Like, dude, it's got Lou Diamond Phillips in it. That's all we care about. It's like, no, it's Richie Valens. Anyway, so like I'm watching the movie and going, that's not true, that's not true, that's not true. I'm that jerk. But my Uncle Gilbert in 1957 was in love with a girl named Donna. So this was like, he's like, it got written for me. Have you ever had that happen where you listen to a song about whatever and you're like, that song is exactly, you're singing my song, bro. You wrote it for me. Like, we've all been there. That's why people love country music, because when you're sad, like, that's it, man. Hank Williams, yeah, that's right. You wrote my life. Like, uh, there's actually a song called that. Oh, Bandy wrote it. Okay. So this is what this psalm did for me. This psalm was my Donna, if you will, of where I was at in life. And to understand it, David has got everything together. He's a man formed after God's own heart, right? Like, he loves David. But David's on the rooftop one day, 
He's got his men out, and everything's going great in his life, and he looks over, peeping Tom, and he sees Bathsheba taking a bath. And he decides he likes what he sees. So he invites her over, takes advantage of her, impregnates her, and then recognizes, well, this is bad. It's not going to look good because she's married to one of my main generals. This guy is like one of the greatest loyal people in the world. This guy loves me, loves his man. This is the top-notch integrity, and I got his wife pregnant. And so David, thinking swiftly, decides, well, what I need to do then is I need to kill her husband. Uriah needs to die. And so after he can't get Uriah to, 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 um, to be with his wife so that, you know, he can pretend it was Uriah's kid, he decides I'm going to get him killed. So he sends Uriah to the front of a horrible battle to make sure that he gets killed, and he basically, he murders Uriah to cover up his tracks, and then he takes Bathsheba to be his bride. And the prophet Nathan comes to him and tells him, and that was so messed up. And God sees that. Like you, this guy had nothing. He's a great, amazing person with nothing. You have everything and you took the one thing you had from him and then you killed him because you stole from him and didn't want to get caught. Like that, that's, that's messed up, right? Like that's low of low. And God says, and he says, you're going to be punished for this. And so David, I love where David reacts to this. Because what David did was wrong. What David's response wasn't, well, you don't understand. It wasn't like that. Like, it's different because, like, we all make excuses, right? David doesn't make an excuse. David's like, yeah, you're right. So much so that when God takes the baby from him, David's like, he's just to do it. Like, I did this. I, I did this horrible, horrible thing. And he ponders it so much that he writes this psalm. And he says, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. I I love this. Let's recognize that it's by the mercy and the love of God that he can blot out, that, that he can erase, that he can change, that he can undo, that he can fix, that he can bring order from the chaos and light from the darkness in our personal lives. That This is the grace and the love of God that does this. I think it's important that we start there. That it's not because we earned it, it's not because we met some, some minimal requirements or prerequisites, but rather because of the grace and love of God, he can do this and he wants to do this. And so David continues and he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. See, I did this thing. Sometimes we're like, you know, I did this, forgive me, help me to move on, help me to get past it, help me to get through this. But he doesn't say that. He says, wash me from this. This is the important part. He's not simply saying to God, or or God's not simply saying, yeah, you really screwed up, but before I forgive you, let's move on like nothing happened. Like you need to just get past this, you need to get through it. We're just going to pretend it didn't happen, put it behind you, the past is in the past. It's, it's not about doing time for the crime. And a lot of times, even as Christians, we act that way. I did this thing, but I met my, my, my punishment, and now I can move on. It's not about that. That's not how this works. It's about being literally washed and cleaned of the sin. It means I have it removed from me. And that's one that's really difficult for us to, to, to a concept for us to understand. How, how can you wash away this sin from me? How can you take away this thing that I have? Because sin is always there before me, right? Like we see it every single day. It's always there. I'm always dealing with it. But he says, wash me from this. Cleanse me thoroughly from my sin. He's saying, take it and remove it from me. When I wash the dirt off of me, I'm not just covering it. I'm not just saying, well, I'm stinky today. I'm going to put on extra cologne. Kyle, just kidding, right? I'm I'm getting in the shower, and what do I do there? I get it off of me. I use the soap to loosen it and then the water to flush it off, right? Because I want it to come off of me and go down the drain. I want it away from me. This is what he's saying about sin. He's saying, it's not saying I'm gonna cover it, I'm gonna gonna wash it off of you. I'm gonna get rid of it. And another word for this process of washing, this process of cleansing from sin It's a big giant word that sometimes we're scared to say. It's the word sanctify. This is the process of being sanctified, of being cleansed from these things, of having it removed from you entirely. And so David says in verse 3, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. I know what I did. And not only that, but it's like it's always there right in front of me, greeting me every single morning. Here's my guilt. Here's my sin. It's right there in front of my face. This, This is how I felt. 
This is where I was at when I read this because, man, my life was horrible. I was a horrible human being. And, and I felt like no matter how much I attended church, how much I stayed away from bad, bad influences, or how much I tried, I felt like my sin was still right there in front of me, and no one was going to let me forget it. I, I remember going in church, and every once in a while I'd be up there, and I'd see somebody walk in from my past, and then they'd be like, oh, they're judging me, they're seeing me, they're knowing it. Like, like it was just, oh, and people calling me and saying, yeah, I heard you win, but I know how you are, bro, you're going to be back. You go to church all you want, but I remember that you did this. I have had people tell me that. Go to church all you want. Call yourself a Christian all you want, but I remember what you did. I was there. So you can't pretend it never happened. Or you're, you're being a fake, they tell me. But you're not fooling me. I was there. I know the real you. Have you ever felt this way? Like here I am trying, because here's the horrible thing about humanity that's true too, is we're really good at bringing each other down. And we know it. That's why we don't like to go to the gym until we're in shape. Because we don't want anyone to see us struggle. Isn't that true? Like, we laugh, but that's the reality about everything in life. I don't want to do anything until I can start as a success. Because the process of working through it means that I'm going to fumble. It means I'm going to look like a fool. It means I'm going to mess up. It means I'm going to look stupid. And I don't want to look stupid in front of other people. Why? Why do you care what they think? Because the reality is, they are going to judge me. They're going to say something. They're going to bring me down. And we do that to each other. Yeah, I knew you weren't going to quit. Ah, that's what I knew. I knew it. I knew it, bro. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. And all I heard was, I knew it. I knew it. I know it. It's going to happen. Like, I, I just could not escape this sin. And I knew it because the chaos and the emptiness and the darkness that came with sin was always right there. I was still facing problems. I still have these things. Still to this day, I have been clean and sober since October of 2004. And to this day, I still have things pop up from my past that are like, hey, here is this thing that you did or this thing that you have to deal with because of that. I'm like, is it ever going to end? Always being reminded that you messed up and you messed everything up in doing it. So listen to what David says. He says, you know what? I realized against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. I think we should really think about that for a second. We are so worried about sinning against each other, and, and that, that's true, we do, but because of that mentality, we often think, well, if I don't sin against somebody else, I'm fine. You sin, your sin is against God. That is who you're hurting, and that is a big deal. So you're justified in your sentence, and you're blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother convinced me, when my mother conceived me. Now, this idea that, that I am born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me, like you're blameless to pass judgment, this doesn't make me feel better. Because every sin that I ever committed, I committed against God. And that's worse than sinning against a loved one or rubbing, robbing your mom. Like, you think, like, this is the worst thing, and this is worse. Like, it's one thing to do that, to, but you do this to here. I remember when my brother, my brother Ray was really struggling with his addiction. And praise God, he's clean and sober now, too, and doing amazing. But I remember him actually breaking into my mom's house, to his own mom's house, to rob her. And if you have friends who are addicts, you know that's a real thing. You will sink to the lowest of the low, and sometimes we do horrible things. But it's not that bad. Like, we, we talked about, like, the worst thing is, like, you broke into your mom. That's, that's how you know you hit rock bottom, when you broke into your mom's house and robbed her. But listen, the one thing worse than robbing your mom is sinning against God. That's actually worse. And we don't think of it that way, but here's the reality. I realized that I sinned against God himself. I had done the most horrific thing I could do, and I did it against God. And because sin is always right there, and we know that God's right to condemn us and his right to turn his back on us, after all, every single one of us was born full of sin, and so we're all lost. And it felt like every voice in my life was reminding me of this, that I was a sinner who brought death to everyone in my life and nothing, no amount of church or prayer or anything is going to change that fact because you know what? People don't change, right? People don't change. I can never change. You'll come back to it. I felt hopeless when it came to sin. I felt like, I'm going to come back to it. I'm going to come back to it. I'm going to eventually come back to it. And I lived in fear of sin. But I want you to realize a truth that David realized. And I want you to consider this and what this truth means for you. He says in verse 6, you desire truth in my inward being. Think about that. God desires absolute truth. He desires faithfulness, trustworthiness from us. That's what this word means, that he desires 
faithfulness, reality, trustworthiness from you. This is God's will for you. This is what he wants for you. How many of us have really reflected on that, that this is what God wants for me? How many of you have ever sat down and prayed and said, Lord, what do you want for me? Not what do you want from me, what do you want for me? I remember my mentor once, when I, when I first started coming over here, um, to, when I first came to Los Banos, he was telling me to shift my prayer in that direction. It's like, why would I ask God what he wants for me? It's like, you need to just spend some time and only on that prayer. Man, and I was on that prayer for months. What is it that you want for me, God? And it's humiliating, it's humbling, it's encouraging, it's all kinds of things to realize that what he wants for me is true, that he wants faithfulness for me. That the same God who brought order, purpose, and light from the chaos and the emptiness and the darkness, the same God who brought life wants you to be true at your very core. He doesn't want you to be whitewashed, not painted over, but he wants you to be genuinely, absolutely, authentically true. And because of that, David simply asked God, therefore, because you desire this truth in my inward being, therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with high sop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you've crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and put a new and a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, do this thing inside of me personally that you did when you hovered over the chaos and the emptiness and the darkness. Do that in me. And that's a prayer. That thing you did at the beginning, do that right here. I need that all right here, and I need to change everything in here because it's full of chaos and emptiness and darkness, and I can't contain it. No matter how much I try to hide it, no matter how much I try to pretend it's not there, no matter how much I try to even control it or keep it at bay or tame it or whatever it is, I can't. It's getting out, so I need you to just change it. Just absolutely change it. David is asking God to sanctify him, to wash him, to remove sin, not to cover it, not to ignore it, but to remove it entirely from him and he's asking God by doing this to give him a real life give me real life and this as David knows is the work of the Holy Spirit this is the work that God does in us and some 500 years later after the people are sent off into exile for sinning against God the prophet Ezekiel comes to them and he shares the word of God to the people of God who've sinned horribly against God. And they failed over and over again to be this royal priesthood, this holy nation that God called them to be. They just can't seem to stop sinning against God. It seems like no matter what they do, they sin against God. And to these people, to these very people who are hopeless, these people who have sinned against God, these people that God calls adulterers, that he actually calls them whores. He calls him horrible things, saying, this is what you've done to me. To these people, God says in Ezekiel 36, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. God promises his people who are dead because of sin that he will put his Holy Spirit within them and remove the source of their sin, this hardened heart that they have. He promises to make them into a new creation, to give them a living heart in place of the dead heart that they were born with. And this is something that he made absolutely good on when Jesus took on flesh and died on the cross. 
when he was resurrected and when the Holy Spirit came upon all the believers to baptize them with the fire that purges away all that was dead and brings forth life. See, God baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that hovered over the chaos and the emptiness and the darkness and it brought order, purpose, and light. And I think the part that, that we miss out on, maybe the part that we don't believe or the part that we're afraid to step into, the part that maybe makes us feel awkward or I don't know, whatever it is, is the reality that he wants to do that in each one of us today. That this is the work that he wants to do in us. See, it's one thing to confess that we're lost and we need to be forgiven. And listen, that's an important thing. It's important to recognize, listen, I'm lost. I need you, Jesus. I need you for the forgiveness of my sins. But we can't simply just say a prayer, desire forgiveness, and then continue battling this sin that keeps trying to bring chaos and death into our lives. Because listen, you're not going to win. You can try to whitewash it all you want. You keep coming down once in a while or praying or whatever it is and pretending it's not there. But if it's there, it's going to defeat you. And this is so heartbreaking because it's something that I see all the time. I see people who who try to give their lives to Christ to say, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give my life to you, Jesus. I need you for my sins. I need you to forgive me so I can go to heaven. And then that's it. And they're waiting and chaos and emptiness still seem to surround them. And they get frustrated because they feel like they're fighting a losing battle. Like no matter what I do, sin is right there. This person's stopping me, but I keep doing this and I keep wrestling with this and I still got this sin there and then there's this sin there. And then it may be a sin of loss or of greed or of pride or whatever it is, but I have this sin that I'm dealing with, this thing that I'm working on and it's just, it just keeps defeating me and so we try to hide it and hide it and try to move on past it and we think I can get to it eventually. I just gotta wait and I just gotta have faith. I just gotta have faith. I just gotta have faith. But we don't do anything with it. We just talk about it. Christians today, every day, continue battling sin and death that was supposed to be defeated by Jesus, and why? We do this because, like David, we need to do more than just believe that Jesus is our Savior. We need to believe. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to fill us. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to baptize us, to purge us of the sin, so that we can be crucified with Christ, in other words, dead to who we were, and then raised again in a genuine life, which is what baptism is about. I am now claiming that I am dead and I'm raised to Christ. That person is dead. And with them, everything, every bit of sin with them is dead. It is gone. But it's not something that we can just claim and it's done. It's something that requires the work of the Holy Spirit. So we have to allow the Holy Spirit to do that in us. And we're like, I want to do it. I'm ready to do it. But I I just don't. Easy. (laughs) Right? I need to just, can we just get to the point where I got the abs? Like, I need you to move that. I don't want to go through the whole process of having to go to the gym and work out and do all of these things. I want to get perfect, and then I'll show up and keep it. Right? How many of us would love that? Like, if you can just fix it, we'll start over and keep it. We love that. That's all that. That's, what do they call that in finances? I need to get one of those loans where I just bring everything together. That way it's just one thing. I take care of it, and I'll keep it. Once I'm good, I'm going to stay good. I promise. The problem is we're not going to if that's the way we act. We have to go through the process. We have to go through the process of sanctification. We have to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And it's ugly and it's messy. And it's it's one of those things where I'm doing good and then I find myself eating cookies. And maybe, maybe not. Maybe I woke up this morning and one sausage turned into six sausages, three fried eggs on a tortilla with cheese on it melted. And I folded over in this breakfast quesadilla. Now, I'm not going to say I did that, but I did. It was amazing, right? And I ate my entire week's worth of calories right there. Like, but we do these things. But we have to be a people who say, look, I've got to be willing to work through it with God and allow the Spirit to do this work in me. We need to be in Christ by having the Holy Spirit in us. And when we do this, when you allow the Holy Spirit to do this, something amazing happens. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. This is a powerful statement that I don't think we consider enough. We are made new. We're renewed. The sin that was was at our core, it isn't tamed. It's completely destroyed. It's removed. They said, I can still sin, but it's not who we are, nor who we're enslaved to be. You can always sin. I don't, I don't care where you're at in life, how holy you are. You have the capability to sin. 
But here's the thing. You also, by the power of the Holy Spirit, if you allow the Holy Spirit to do it, you have the ability to not sin. And that's the part that we don't like to talk about. Yeah, but I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's all I'll ever be. I'm going to sin, so why not just be real? You want to be real? Don't sin. Sin is fake. It's acting fake. It's doing something that's contrary to reality. But I don't have to because of the work of the Holy Spirit. But we have to get that part in. I don't have to because of the work of the Holy Spirit. So I don't have to because I can will it away or I'm strong enough because you're not. Nobody is. I need the Spirit to do this work within me. I have to bring myself to my knees, whatever it is, and say, Lord, do this in me. Do a prayer like David did. He already slayed the giant. He already killed his tens of thousands. He already did all kinds of amazing things. And yet after he'd done all these things that I might argue would make him look like a much better follower of God than many of us, even after all that, he came to his knees and he said, you know what? Sanctify me entirely. Make me something new. Being righteous is what's real, and sinning becomes what is fake. And when this happened in my life, I was given this new path. This is the part that I really love now for me. Because before, my first prayer to God was, I just don't want to die. Like, I know I'm going to hell when I do, but for right now, can you not let me die? And God took away drugs so I wouldn't die. I thought, if that's all you do, we're good. Like, that's more than I deserve. But then he brought me through this process where we realized that I didn't have to even go to hell. I don't get that, but that's cool. I'm on my own P's and Q's. And then maybe I'll get to go to heaven. Because all I've ever done is brought darkness in this world. And he says, no, now you're going to answer a call. David says, forgive me, cleanse me. He says, then, then I'm going to teach transgressors your ways. And sinners are going to return to you. Oh, Lord, open my lips. Deliver me from bloodshed, oh God, oh God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. Oh, Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Like it's not even not just about not dying, right? Living isn't about not dying. And it's not even not about going to hell. But now it's about being cleansed so that I have a purpose. So that where I once brought darkness into this world and everything that I did... Now I can live this righteous life, be real, and I get to be a part of doing something good. And look, I mess it up. I get it. I'm not the perfect pastor. I don't think there's a person in here I have not ticked off. I bet there's not a person in here that I have not had question going, yeah, there's no way I'm following this guy anymore. I've done that to everybody. I get it. I mess up. I'm going to mess up again. But I'm never going to stop doing this because I can now. And this is what you're called to do. See, we need to stop being a people who fight sin every single day. But say, you know what? I'm giving it up to you, God, and I'm done with it because I don't have to fight it like that with everything that I am. Yes, I have to be conscious of it. Yes, I have to recognize it. But it doesn't need to consume me. It doesn't need to be a part of my chaos and my emptiness, God. So make me whole. Sanctify me. That's my prayer for you. So how many here would pray this even today to God? Because this part where it's like, oh, yeah, you say that, it sounds good, but I don't want to be the one who goes to the gym looking bad. I want to make sure that I look at least decent before I go to the gym. And we think that's funny, but that's how we do everything. And we're so consumed with what others think, knowing that they're going to judge us, that we never make it to the gym. So how many who need this would come down to the altars? and pray so I'm opening them up to you this is a time if the Lord is calling you and you want to just be sanctified and just invite him in then come down and do it and come to your knees and take that first step but it's tough it's difficult I get it I hate altar calls because I'm always like I don't want to be the one to go down there I don't want to go down there I want to be real you know what you do whatever it is you need to do but be real if you were the only person, if you had a gym to yourself, would you go? If you can't support each other, if you can't depend on each other, we have a lot of work to do. Father, we seek you. We need you.
just get caught up in your presence, Father. You don't owe us anything, Father. But you want this for us, which is so much better. Because I don't want to follow a God who owes me life. I want to follow a God who wants me to have life. And I pray, Lord, that you would remove the evil from our bodies, that evil, that lying voice that says that you don't want that for us. But to recognize, people to say that my God wants me to have true life. So much so that he would take on flesh, that he would go to the cross, that he would die, that he would face the most humiliating, horrible thing in this world because he wants that so much for me. That's the God I worship. And let us be those people. We're gathered here today, Father. Sanctify us entirely. Holy Spirit, fill us. You are our God, the giver of life. Bring life here and now and relinquish us from these sins. Free us from these things. Make us whole. Make us real right now, Father. Let us no longer be ashamed of what sin does to us. And let us know that shame is also of the enemy. We can be guilty of something, Father, but we don't have to be ashamed. I'm guilty of a lot of horrible things. But I will not let shame con- consume me or drive me. Because I am your child. I am your creation and you desire good for me. Thank you, Father. Sanctify each one of us, Father. Be with each one of us, my brothers and my sisters here today, Lord. We come before you and we pray for your Spirit upon us. Holy Spirit, sanctify each one of us. Make us full, make us whole, make us yours, Father. Holy Spirit, be faithful to our hearts. And make our hearts faithful to you. Make us true. Make us righteous. Make us yours in every way, Father. And then bring us together as a family so we would be those who would encourage one another, who would cheer each other on, Father, who would look at this this amazing group who have gone before us, Father, that hall of faith, and say, because there's such a cloud of witnesses that surround us, Father, we too would keep our eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, Lord, as we strive on this marathon, as we kick off all the chains and sins that bind us, all the things that hold us down, Father, we relinquish them to you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, take them from us so we would be whole, we would be real, we would be able to live life to your glory, Father. Sanctify us, I pray this. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.